So the components of your skeletal system include the bones and then all the cartilages, tendons and ligaments that connect bone to bones and muscle to bones. Um, here we have the bones of the skeletal system, which you'll be spending a lot of time in lab going through. Um, we'll be going over the axial and appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is made of all the bones and kind of the cranium and rib cage and spinal column. And then the appendicular skeleton includes all the bones of your appendages, so your arms and legs. And you can see those shown there. Um, functions of the skeletal system, um, your bones are important for supporting uh, your body so you can stand upright, protecting underlying structures and organs, moving parts of your body, as well as storage. So your bones will store different um, cells, um, as well as blood cell production. So we have different skeletal system functions as shown here. The extracellular matrix of um, bone, remember, is bone is a type of connective tissue. So bone, cartilage, tendons, and ligaments, they're all types of connective tissue. And they're different varying by their extracellular matrix. So what makes up kind of the substance outside of their cells? The matrix will always contain those collagen protein fiber bundles, ground substance, which kind of holds everything together, and all other organic molecules, as well as water and especially minerals, which will give bone its kind of hard substance. Uh, collagen is the tough rope-like protein. Proteoglycans are very large molecules consisting of many sugars attached to each other. Those are polysaccharides. They will attach and encircle the core protein of a proteoglycan. And the proteoglycan will form kind of large aggregates that will attract and hold water. So the, that's what it is important about proteoglycans. They kind of hold water in them. And the extracellular matrix of um, tendons and ligaments contains large amounts of collagen fibers, making those structures very tough, like a rope or a cable. Um, the extracellular matrix of cartilage specifically contains collagen and those proteoglycans. Um, collagen makes the cartilage tough and the proteoglycans, which again are filled with water, make it smooth and resilient. So cartilage is rigid, but it can spring back to its original shape if it's slightly compressed and it makes cartilage a very good shock absorber. The extracellular matrix of bone contains collagen and minerals, and the minerals, calcium and phosphate, um, are what give bone its weight-bearing strength and kind of compact, hard structure. It does have collagen fibers to lend flexible strength to bone, and most of the mineral in bone is the form of calcium phosphate crystals, which we, called, which we um, call hydroxyapatite. Shape classification of bones. So we classify kind of all the bones in the body into four groupings of shapes, long, short, flat, and irregular. Long bones are longer than they are wide, like your upper and lower limb bones, your humerus, your femur. Short bones are about kind of cuboidal in shape. So like the bones of your wrist and ankle. Flat bones have a relatively thin, flattened shape, like the bones of your skull and sternum. And irregular bones include your vertebrae and facial bones that have shapes that don't fit into any of the other categories. And for those of you who just joined us, I'm going to put your attention to this announcement that I posted last week on February 9th. You have a lab exam today if you have Monday lab, and you will have another lecture exam um, on Wednesday on chapters five and six. And then Monday, there's no lecture or lab. And Wednesday, if you have Wednesday lab, there's no. So just take a look at this most recent announcement. Take a look at also Jennifer's tutoring information if you want to tutor help and then look for some study tips that I will try to post by tonight for sure by tomorrow night. I know you guys want to study, so I'll try to post them this afternoon. Just wanted to point that out because we had a lot of people join. Okay, so the long bone structure, um, the diaphysis is kind of the shaft part of the bone. So the body or the shaft is called your diaphysis. Um, compact bone will kind of line the outer edges of the diaphysis, where spongy bone lines the inner side, or there's a hollow space called a medullary cavity. It will contain um, red bone marrow in juveniles and yellow bone marrow in adults. And the ends of your bone tissue, the ends of bone tissue are called the epiphysis regions, and they will contain the spongy bone tissue. 
And then articular cartilage is what covers the ends of the, your bones, the epiphysis ends. And this will help to reduce friction when your bones kind of rub against each other and articulate with each other at your, at your joints. The epiphyseal plate, which is shown right here, um, it, it kind of differs a little bit where it is in juveniles or adults, but this will be the site of growth um, between the diaphysis and the epiphysis ends. And then the medullary cavity is what will contain red or yellow marrow. Red bone, mar red bone marrow is what will create your red blood cells and yellow bone marrow is just a storage for your lipids. The periosteum is the membrane that covers the outer bone surface. And the end osteum is the membrane that lines the inner medullary cavity. So we kind of have some basic anatomy of the long bone structures as shown here. So here's the structure of the long bone that I just zoomed in on these last two pages. And then this is what we're gonna be looking at next. This is where we kind of looked a little bit in lab. Um, we'll look at how your compact bone and spongy bone is kind of made up of osteoms called haversion systems. You see the periosteum is the outer connected tissue covering of the bone. You know, in general, when you look at bone, what you see in this picture is you see blood vessels. Bone is a living live tissue that's constantly being remodeling because it's storing excess calcium in your body. So when your body needs more calcium, bone will be, re be remodeled to release calcium and then calcium will be stored in bone um, to be used later. So bone marrow um, is contained in the cavities, such as the large medullary cavity in the diaphysis, as well as in smaller cavities of some of the epiphysis ends of your long bones. And they are filled with marrow. Red marrow is the location of blood forming cells and yellow marrow is mostly all fat. In newborns, most of the bones have blood making red bone marrow as newborns are trying to create a lot of red blood cells. And in adults, we've usually replaced a lot of that red bone marrow with yellow bone marrow. Um, in adults, for example, the example, most of your red bone marrow is in the flat bones of your skull and other parts of the body and the long bones of the femur and humerus. Here is compact bone tissue then. So we're not talking about spongy bone, we're talking about compact bone. It lines the outer edges of the diaphysis in long bones and the thinner surfaces in other bones. And we'll talk about an osteon, which is kind of one structural unit of compact bone. And we'll go through kind of the parts of an osteon, the lamella, the lacunae, the canaliculus, central canal, and osteocytes. Um, first of all, the lamella are just rings of bone matrix that surround the central canal. And I'll show you a better picture here in a couple slides. Uh, the lacuna are spaces between the lamella where your osteocytes, your mature bone cells will kind of reside. The canaliculus are tiny canals that connect lacuna together so that your osteocytes can communicate with each other. They'll also transport nutrients, remove waste, and then the central canal is the center of the osteon that contains all of your blood vessels. So let's take a look at a better picture here. This light microscopic image is one that we saw when we went over connective tissue in lab. And then we're looking at kind of one central um, osteon, which is one kind of unit of compact bone. It runs parallel. It has a central canal that will contain blood vessels. Um, and then it has rings of lamella that circle the central canal. We have lamella rings of bone matrix on the surface of the bone between osteons. Um, and then you can see the periosteum again is the outer bone covering. Um, and you can see kind of how all the blood vessels are interconnected to connect the osteons together. And again, that is to allow for communication. And just to show you again, that bone is a living live tissue constantly being remodeled. You'll see osteocytes, which are our mature bone cells found in the lacuna or spaces um, within the lamella where they reside as well. And then spongy or cancellous bone tissue is located at the epiphyses, so the ends of your long bones, and then at the center of other bones. And it has what we call trabeculae, which are interconnecting rods of bone matrix, um, makes it look like, look like an actual sponge. And that spaces that contain marrow. It does not have osteons though. So its bone tissue is arranged a little differently. 
You'll see osteocytes in the lacuna. You'll see other types of bone cells, osteoblasts and osteoclasts. But you'll see right away, you know, how compact bone kind of lines the edges and periphery and spongy bone makes up the more deeper part of the bone itself. And a spongy bone looks like a sponge. All of these kind of bone tissue rods are called trabeculae. Bone cells. So first of all, all bone cells start with the prefix osteo. Blasts are responsible for the formation of bone and the repair and remodeling of bone. So osteoblasts build bone. Think of that B word that's connected right there. Osteoblasts will build or form your bone. Osteocytes are just the mature bone cells. So keep that in mind. Osteocytes are mature bone cells. That might be a test question. That maintain bone matrix and form from osteoblasts after the bone matrix has surrounded it. So just keep that in mind that osteocytes maintain bone matrix, but they are the mature bone cell. And then osteoclasts contribute to bone repair and remodeling by removing existing bone called bone reabsorption and focus on the C sound. I'm gonna change the C to a K because sometimes C and K sound the same. So osteoclasts will kill bone or break it down. It's just a way that I've always remembered it in my head. So osteoblasts build bone, form bone matrix, and osteoclasts kill bone or remove existing bone. And we call that bone reabsorption. Ossification is the formation of bone by osteoblasts, and bone formation occurs within connective tissue membranes. And if it does that, we call it intramembranous ossification. And bone formation that incurs inside hyaline cartilage, so using kind of your hyaline cartilage as a model for bone growth, that is called endochondral ossification. And you can see that chondro. Um, cartilage um, kind of word stem in there. And both types of bone formation result in compact and spongy bone. So we'll go over how bone is um, forms now. I wanted to say formatted, but that was not the right word. So intramembranous ossification occurs when your osteoblasts produce and build bone within connective tissues. And this usually happens um, with the bones of your skull where osteoblasts slide up on the surface and then begin depositing bone matrix to form trabeculae or spongy bone. This process begins in kind of a central area called the ossification center and trabeculae kind of radiate out from that center and usually two or more ossification centers exist in each flat bone skull, so your frontal, parietal, temporal, um, occipital, and they result in the mature bone cells will result from fusion of these centers as they get enlarged to form the cranium. The trabeculae are constantly remodeled and they may enlarge or be replaced by those compact bone. And this is showing how this occurs um, in the bone formation in the fetus, so forming the cranium um, from these kind of central ossification centers in the fetus. And eventually these ossification centers um, will fuse together, but as you know, babies will leave some spots unfused together to allow the head to fit through the birth canal, and we call that soft spot a fontanelle, um, and usually these bones will continue fusing um, by age one or 12 or 13 months, sometimes a little longer, especially this fontanelle on the top. And then endochondral Bone formation, um, again, this word stem, chondral, has to do with cartilage, um, where you'll have a cartilage model and then that will be replaced by bone. It will initially form from a primary ossification center, which is bone formation in the diaphysis part, the long um, body part of the long bone. And then the secondary ossification center is bone formation in the epiphysis or the ends. And these are the steps in um, endochondral ossification. And we talk about these steps because you can easily see these steps um, in a microscope slides. So chondroblasts, which are um, cartilage cells that build cartilage, build a cartilage model. The chondroblasts will become chondrocytes, which are mature cartilage cells. You can see how these word roots kind of are similar. The cartilage model then calcifies, it becomes hardened and then osteoblasts will kind of come in to form ossification centers. 
And then we'll have a secondary ossification center forming. Um, the first one forms your diaphysis, the long part. A secondary ossification center forms the epiphysis so that the original cartilage model is almost completely kind of taken over and ossified by bone cells. And any remaining cartilage that exists will be the articular cartilage that forms the ends of your epiphysis bones. And remember that articular cartilage allows for a nice smooth kind of frictionless movement between your joints when they articulate with each other. So here's a look at endochondral ossification of a long bone, you know, showing how we start with a cartilage, hyaline cartilage model that eventually um, calcifies, it gets become harder, and then bone comes in and then bone forms the primary ossification center. We have a secondary ossification center that forms and then any remaining cartilage remains on the ends called articular cartilage. Bone growth in width. So bone growth also occurs by the deposition of new bone lamella, which are the rings of tissue onto existing bone. Osteoblasts will develop new bone matrix. So that kind of um, the surface of bones between the periosteum and the existing bone matrix increases. So we call this any sort of increase in width or diameter of a bone is called apositional growth, and that's bone growth in width. And then growth in the length of the bone, which is the major source of how we um, get taller, occurs in the epiphyseal plate. And this is what occurs through what we talked about, that endochondral ossification, where we start with chondrocytes and the hyaline cartilage model, increasing in number, specifically on the epiphyseal side of the epiphyseal plate, to eventually turn cartilage into bone. And that's how we get um, bone growth in length, which makes us all taller. The chondrocytes eventually enlarge and die. Um, the matrix become calcified. And then osteoclasts move in to kind of remove any enlarged dead cells. And then dying chondrocytes are replaced by osteoblasts to put down a new bone. And that's bone growth in length. The osteoblasts will start by forming bone, by depositing bone lamella on the surface of the calcified cartilage. And this process produces bone on the diaphyseal side. So the kind of the length side of the epiphyseal plate. And we can see this underneath the microscope as well. This is endochondral bone growth in length. So growing the bone longer. This occurs at this area called the epiphyseal plate which is the area between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. And we can see here chondrocytes and dividing and enlarging, they become calcified and they're eventually replaced by bone. And this is a common picture we see under um, a light microscope showing the different steps, showing kind of the hyaline cartilage and how the cells become larger. They fill up, they die, they become calcified and then the cartilage is then replaced by bone on the diaphyseal side, which is shown here. Bone remodeling. So our bones are constantly being remodeled. remodeled. Um, this is removal of existing bone by osteoclasts because they kill, reabsorb bone, and depositing new bone by osteoblasts that build it. This occurs in all of your bone. This occurs in your teeth if you've gotten braces before. And this is responsible for changes in bone shape, bone repair, adjustment of bone distress, as well as calcium ion regulation. Because calcium ions are stored in your bones of your skeleton, bones are constantly being remodeled to either um, put more calcium into your blood or store more calcium into your skeleton. This also is important for when you exercise and do weight-bearing exercises. Weight-bearing exercises are very good at building up your bone. They increase the activity of your osteoblasts um, so exercise is very important for keeping your bones strong. Bone repair. So I'm sure some of us have personal experience with bone repair or someone close to us has broken a bone. Um, a broken bone will cause bleeding because if you break a bone, you'll most likely break the blood vessels that are within it. So a blood clot will always form. So a clot, platelets will travel to the area of the breakage to form a blood clot. That's kind of the first step in the repairing of a bone. A callus will then form, which is a fibrous network between two fragments to kind of start to piece it back together. Then a cartilage model forms first, 
and then osteoblasts enter the callus to form the cancellous bone. And this continues for about four to six weeks after injury. So, you know, broken bones usually take six to eight weeks, maybe three or four if you're like three years old. Um, and that's just because that's how long it takes for osteoblasts to come in and repair. Cancellous bone, which is your spongy bone, is then slowly remodeled to form compact and cancellous bone. So here we have a fractured humerus. Um, we have the hematoma or the blood clot forming. And then we have the callus formation, which is kind of the initial fibers that come together to try to piece things back together. We have cartilage forming with the callus ossifying. So it'll ossify first and the bone then will be completely remodeled. And this takes about six to eight weeks, sometimes less if you're a younger person. Bone and calcium homeostasis. So now we're going to talk about how your bones carry calcium. And calcium is a very important ion in the body that your muscles need to contract and you need to perform a variety of other functions. So the levels of calcium in your blood called calcium homeostasis need to be maintained. And this is where bones come in because bones are the mage storage site for calcium. Movement of calcium in and out of the bone helps to determine your blood levels of calcium. And calcium moves into the bone as osteoblasts will build new bone because they'll store the calcium in the new bone they're building. And then calcium moves out of the bone as osteoclasts break the bone down and release calcium into the blood. And the two main type of hormones that control these calcium levels um, are parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. So these calcium levels are shown here and how these two kind of hormones um, influence these calcium levels. So if you have a decreased blood calcium level, let's say your levels of calcium in the blood are lower than normal, your parathyroid glands, which are located on the back of your thyroid hormone, secrete a hormone called parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone does a couple of things. It absorbs calcium from the kidney, from the gut. It stimulates osteoclasts to break down bone to release calcium and to try to put calcium back into the blood via one of these three ways, by absorbing calcium from your gut, by your kidneys re re reabsorbing calcium, or by moving calcium that was stored in your bones into the blood to try to increase calcium levels. If you have too much blood calcium, so let's look at the opposite side of the spectrum. If your blood calcium levels are through the roof, um, calcitonin is released and calcitonin is released from your thyroid gland, calcitonin will inhibit osteoclasts. So it won't allow osteoclasts to break down the bone. And what that does is when you inhibit osteoclasts, you tell your osteoblasts to promote calcium deposition in the bone. So calcitonin will take calcium out of the blood and put it back into your skeletal system. An easy way to remember this is calcitonin, and I'm looking at this stem right here, the tone part, calcitonin tones down blood calcium levels. So calcium tonin decreases blood calcium levels in the blood and parathyroid hormone increases it. Some bone anatomical terms now, and this will help you understand kind of lab and when we get into all the bone markings and bone projections. If we ever label anything as a foramen, that means a hole, for example, the magnum foramen, a fossa is a depression, um, like the glenoid fossa, where the head of the humerus will sit. And a process is any sort of projection from a bone or bony kind of part that sticks off of a bone, like your mastoid process. A condyle is a smooth, rounded end, such as your occipital condyles, which are kind of nice rounded ends, so your skull can sit on your first vertebrae. A uh, meatus is also a hole, but it's more canal shaped, like your external auditory meatus, that's your ear canal. And then a tubercle is like a lump or a bump on a bone, like your greater tubercle on your humerus, which we will see um, a little bit of lecture and we'll spend time in lab too. So now we're gonna go over your axial skeleton 
And um, I'm, I'm going to go over this not rather quickly, but we we go over it in lab as well. So you'll spend a lot of time in lab studying the bones of the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. But your axial skeleton consists of your skull, vertebral column, and thoracic cage. Your skull has 22 bones divided into those of the brain case or cover the brain and then those of the face. And the brain case, also called the cranium, encloses um, the brain itself, and those will be eight bones. And then your bony structure of your face has 14 facial bones, and that's how we get to 22 bones of the skull itself. Um, 13 of your facial bones are all solidly connected, but the mandible, this is kind of a good test question, it's the only um, skull bone that has a freely movable joint to allow you to chew. And there are also three auditory ossicle bones. Ossicle means teeny tiny bones in each middle ear, so for six total. And those little auditory ossicle bones, we will look at a little more when we get to your special senses and when we talk about hearing. So the cranial bones, we have frontal, parietal bones, occipital bones, and temporal bones. Um, I'm going to just show you a picture of these because that'll help explain things a little more. So you can read through the descriptions and then I'll show you pictures. Sphenoid bone forms a part of your cranium floor, which your brain will sit on in parts of your eye orbits. Your sphenoid bone looks like a butterfly bone. It sits behind your eyes. It has a part called the cella turcica, which holds your pituitary gland. Um, the ethmoid bone sits kind of up and behind your nose, helps to form the nasal concha, which are kind of the ridges on the lateral walls of the nose. The maxilla forms your upper jaw below your eye socket, so what your upper row of teeth will kind of be embedded into, as well as the lower and lateral walls of your nasal cavity and eye orbits. And we have a space within your maxilla called the maxillary sinus. Whenever you see the word sinus, that just means a space in some of these bones. And then the palatine bones form kind of the back portion of your hard palate, as well as the lateral wall of your nasal kind of cavity. Zygomatic bones are your cheekbones. They help to form the floor and the lateral wall of your eye orbit where your eyeball will sit. Lacrimal bones are on the inside by your noses and the nasal bones form the bridge of your nose. If you break your nose, if you're not you know, breaking your septum, which is the wall of cartilage down the middle, um, if you actually broke your nose, you most likely broke one of these nasal bones. The vomer forms, um, helps to form the midline of the nasal cavity. It forms parts of the nasal septum. With your ethmoid bone, you have inferior nasal concha attached to the lateral walls of your nasal cavity. And the mandible is your jaw bone. It's the only movable skull bone. So let's take a look at some pictures here. And again, in lab um, today and last week, and really these couple, you know, several weeks, you can go over the lab exercises because they will help you and practice labeling all of these bones of the skull. So you can see these bones labeled of the skull here, frontal bone. You have one frontal bone and two parietal bones, um, tem two temporal bones and one occipital bones. And these bones of the skull are what will, are, will be formed or fused together with these sutures or fibrous joints that they come and fuse together. So there's your squamous suture and there's a coronal suture. And then the bones of the face, I'm going to take us to this look. We have the maxilla in orange, the mandible in purple, um, the zygomatic bones are your cheekbones. And then you can see here, you know, your nasal bones in blue. These concha are make up the lateral walls of your bones. In purple, you can see the sphenoid bone and how it sits behind the eyes. Um, a part of the sphenoid bone is shown kind of in your temple region there as well. In this sagittal view, you can also see this green lacrimal bone. And then if we take kind of your cranium top, your head off and look and we remove your brain, we can see these fossa, um, the anterior cranial fossa, um, the posterior cranial fossa, and these will be just areas of parts of your brain will fit in. We see in purple here, your sphenoid bone and different holes in your sphenoid bone. Um, we'll go over these holes. You'll see they all have a name, foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, foramen spinosum. We have internal auditory canals. The foramen magnum is the big hole that your spinal cord will spit down. 
In yellow, you see the temporal bones and even more holes, the carotid canal. Um, the cella turcica is this area right here where your pituitary gland will sit. You have optic foramens where your optic nerves will travel through. Um, and then in the ethmoid bone, you can see your ethmoid bone is shown here or the top part of it. You see kind of a ridge called the crista galli. And then surrounding that ridge, you see what we call the cribiform plate. And if you look closely, there's little tiny dots in that cribiform plate. And that's what your olfactory um, nerves will travel down into your nose to help with smell. So again, this is a lot of, the skull is really tricky and we're looking at it from the bottom now, just seeing other angles. Uh, the incisive foramen is a hole behind your incisor teeth. Here's your um, hard palate, which may, is made up of the ma um, some maxilla bones and palatine bones. You see the zygomatic bone kind of forming this zygomatic arch with your temporal bone behind it. Um, so this is a lot of information and I tell you in lab too, you'll just have to spend some time in the exercises working through this and labeling um, in the virtual laboratory as well. Um, these are the occipital condyles, which are rounded bumps that your skull will use to kind of rest or sit on your first um, cervical vertebrae. Paranasal sinuses. So several of your bones have cavities within them called sinuses that open to your nasal cavity. Um, you have spaces or sinuses in the frontal, ethmoid, sphenoid, and maxilla bones, so kind of the bones surrounding the nasal cavity. Um, to help with sound production, resonance, and just to kind of warm and humidify the air. So if you have a sinus infection, it's usually an infection found in one of these sinuses as shown here. The hyoid bone then is unpaired. It's a U-shaped bone. It does, it's not part of the skull. It has no direct bony attachment to your skull or any other bones. Um, the hyoid bone has the unique distinction of being the only bone in the body that does not articulate or touch with another bone. But your hyoid bone is very important because it provides an attachment for some of your tongue muscles. And it's an attachment point for important neck muscles that help to elevate your larynx uh, to help with swallowing. So here's your hyoid bone. And you can see here how it sits kind of right underneath your mandible, but it's not actually connected to any other bone, it's only connected to different muscles and ligaments to support your tongue and your larynx. So that's your hyoid bone. Then the vertebral column is the spine. It's the central axis of your skeleton. It goes from the base of your skull to slightly past the pelvis and it consists of 26 individual bones which we group into five regions. And your vertebral column has four curvatures, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacrococcygeal. And we'll show you a picture of these curvatures. Um, the cervical region of your spinal cord are all the vertebra and the curve that kind of goes anteriorly. The thoracic region curves back, the lumbar region curves to the front again, and the sacral and coccygeal regions curve together posteriorly. And I'll show you a picture of that. Here we have vertebral columns and how many vertebrae or bones make up each section. We have seven cervical vertebra, 12 thoracic vertebra, which connect to 12 ribs, five lumbar vertebra, one sacrum, and one coccyx, which is your tailbone. The atlas and axis are special first and second cervical vertebra. Your atlas holds your head up and your axis rotates the head. So your functions of your vertebral column, it literally supports all of your body weight. It protects your spinal cord. It allows spinal nerves to exit your spinal cord. And we'll talk about that when we get to your nervous system. It provides a site for muscle attachment and it provides movement of the head and the trunk. So here we have the cervical region and how it curves anteriorly. There you have seven cervical vertebra. Here we have the thoracic region curving posteriorly, and you have 12 thoracic vertebra. And then you have the lumbar region curving anterior, anteriorly, again, you have five lumbar vertebra. And um, a professor once taught me a way to remember these numbers. If you eat breakfast at seven, lunch at 12 noon, and supper at five, that might help you remember the numbers of vertebra in each of those sections.
This vertebral column curvature is really important um, in order for humans to walk on two legs. So before babies have the ability to stand upright and walk, their curvature is much more planar, horizontal with the floor as they're crawling. And all four-legged animals, their spine is much more, their curvature, they don't have as many curves in their spine because they don't need to walk on two legs. So this is why it's really important to allow babies to learn to walk on their own and don't push them too much because they'll walk when their vertebral column can support their body, their upper body weight. And that can take 12 months. Sometimes it can take 14 or 15 months or more than a year. So don't be concerned if your baby can't walk yet, they should be crawling really well first. Um, then the sacrum is kind of fused um, vertebra that come together to form one piece and the coccyx is your tailbone. So here's a look at a typical vertebra and landmarkings. And again, we'll spend time in lab going over this as well. The spinous process is the part that you can feel if you run your fingers up and down your spine. Transverse processes come out at a perpendicular angle to the spinous process. Um, the body is what your vertebral discs will sit on. Uh, and then the vertebral foramen, the nice hole is what your spinal cord goes down. Uh, the lamina are kind of the, the walls leading up to the spinous process. And then you have articulating, um, superior articulating processes on the top. And on the bottom, you have inferior articulating processes and facets. And these are what kind of stick above and below each vertebra to allow your vertebra to kind of hook and kind of be um, kind of stacked nicely on top of each other like a puzzle piece. And then the pedicle is just kind of the arms or the legs that come off of the body that connect the anterior body part of the vertebra to the posterior kind of structures of each vertebra. And there's regional differences in vertebra. So this is a look at your atlas, the first cervical vertebra. It has no spinous process. There's a big vertebral foramen because the spinal cord will be thickest here. Um, so that is the atlas. Uh, the axis is C2. It has what we call, I call it the thumbs up feature. It's the dens. The axis, um, the dens of your axis will fit in your atlas to allow you to shake your head no. So for you to kind of shake your head on an axis. And then other cervical vertebra that are not C1 or C2, some things that make them very unique is that their spinous process is bifid or split. And they all have um, transverse foramen or holes in their transverse processes that allow for blood vessels to travel up and down to the brain. Thoracic vertebra um, is kind of the typical vertebra that we saw on the previous slide like this, except things that make your thoracic vertebra unique are you have these costal facets or connection pieces for your ribs to attach because your 12 thoracic vertebra are attached to your 12 ribs. And then the lumbar vertebra, the big thing that make your lumbar vertebra very unique is they have the thickest body because they will be um, the ones holding up really the top half of your body weight. Here's the sacrum. Um, you can see that there's what we call the median sacral crest, which is kind of a remnant of spinous processes from fused vertebra that have come together to form the sacrum. We have articulating facets that will connect with the L5 lumbar vertebra, which will sit on top of it. Um, we also have the coccyx, which is your tailbone, and then um, different foramina on the front and back to allow different passageways for nerves and blood vessels to travel through. One thing to remember, whenever you have a hole in a bone or a process or a depression, you know all of these markings on bones serve a purpose usually a blood vessel or a nerve is traveling through a hole, um, a bony process or a prominent, like even thing that sticks out, usually serves as an attachment for a muscle, a ligament, connective tissue. So all of these bone markings um, have a purpose. So the thoracic cage then protects your vital organs, your lungs, your hearts. It includes 12 pairs of ribs that connect to the sternum or the breastbone in the front and then this, um, the thoracic vertebra in the back. You have true ribs that are attached directly to your sternum by cartilage. Your false ribs are attached indirectly to your sternum by cartilage. And then you have two sets of floating ribs that are just hanging out in your back. 
So here we have the thoracic cage. And again, it forms a cage to protect your lungs and your heart. So very important structures, including your esophagus, um, parts of your, you know, well, your stomach will be below that, but this is very important to protect your lungs and your heart. So here we have the 12 sets of ribs. The true ribs are connected right to the sternum. In the sternum, we have the manubrium, which is the top part connected to the clavicles or your collarbones, the body of the sternum, and then the xiphoid process is usually where you're aiming for your 30 chest compressions in CPR. Um, you have the false ribs are eight to 12 because they're not directly attached to the sternum. They kind of have to go through another connection piece of cartilage to get there. And then 11 and 12 are also false ribs, but they're just floating ribs in the back. Um, we talked about bone repair. If you break a rib, unfortunately, there's not much that can be done. Normally, it's just a slight crack. It's incredibly painful, but you kind of just have to let ribs heal on their own if they're ever cracked. And then we'll get into your appendicular skeleton. And this is where um, you'll spend time in lab even more so going over this, but your scapula is your shoulder blade and your clavicle is your collarbone. And these are bones that make up the pectoral girdle, which is, which are the bones that connect your upper limbs to the axial skeleton. So here's your pectoral girdle. The only connection between your upper limb and the axial skeleton is where your clavicle connects to your sternum. The scapula makes up the other part of the um, pectoral girdle, and then your humerus will be connected and held into place in your scapula. You have your radius and ulna as your forearm, and then you have carpal bones in the wrist, metacarpal bones in the palm of your hand, and phalanges in your digits or your fingers. One thing to note is the radius always lines up with the thumb. So your radius in anatomical position is always lateral next to your thumb, and the ulna always lines up with the pinky and is more medial in anatomical position. This is important to remember because your radius and ulna will crisscross each other. When you do this action of pronation and supination, your radius and ulna are parallel, but they actually crisscross each other when you put your forearms down. Um, so it's just really just kind of get that through your head that the radius always lines up with your thumb and the ulna always lines up with your pinky. And then here's the scapula and the clavicle in general. You can see how they connect here. So if we take a look at the posterior view of your scapula first, here's the spine of your scapula, which you can feel. And then the bony kind of bump at the top of your shoulder is called the acromion process. And that's where the clavicle will connect. And then on the anterior view, you have another process called the coracoid process. Looks like a beak of a bird. Um, and the acromion, and chromion, the acromion process and the coracoid process serve for different ligaments and muscle attachments to hold the head of your humerus, which will fit in nicely to this glenoid cavity to form your ball and socket joint of the shoulder. We have different fossa, subscapular fossa, infraspinous fossa, supraspinous fossa, um, they will all hold different muscles in them, but remember, fossa is just a depression in a bone. And then this side of your scapula is the medial border that will be closer to the midline of the body. And then you have lateral borders, and then you have points, you have an inferior angle, and you'll have a superior angle up here. And then here's the clavicle, the distal and proximal end of your clavicle, with the proximal end being the part that attaches to the manubrium and the distal end being the part that attaches to the acromion of your scapula. Then here are your upper limb bones, uh, the humerus, the ulna and radius, the carpals and metacarpals, and you can see them lined up here. So again, we'll spend time in lab going over this. You can work through the virtual lab exercises to get familiar with these structures. And then we have different markings on the humerus. The head of the humerus will form the ball and socket joint with your scapula. The anatomical neck surrounds the head of the humerus, whereas the surgical neck surrounds the diaphysis part of the humerus. You have a little bump called the deltoid tuberosity here where your deltoid, your shoulder muscle attaches. And then on the distal end of the humerus, you have a lot going on. We have epicondyles, which are small rounded bumps. 
um, on the medial and lateral side of your humerus. The medial epicondyle, it's your inside elbow bone. You can kind of feel that on the inside of your elbow, the medial epicondyle, because you can see how it sticks out a little bit more there. Um, you know, when people say they hit their funny bone, they think they hit that medial epicondyle. But actually, when you hit your funny bone, you're not hitting a bone at all. You're kind of jamming or hitting your ulnar nerve, and that's what makes it hurt so much. More condyles, we have the capitulum, which will line up with the head of the radius. You have a nice trochlea, which helps to form um, the elbow joint with your ulna. So there's your trochlea, kind of smooth, rounded articulation. And then the olecranon fossa is a deep depression on your posterior end of the humerus on the backside where the ulna um, kind of joint will form as well. The radius and ulna then are parallel bones in your forearm with the uh, styloid process of the radius lining up with your thumb and the styloid process of your ulna lining up with your pinky. And this just shows how your head of your radius and the um, ulna kind of fit together at the top. Um, the ulna at the top has what we call the olecranon process, and this will fit into um, via the trochlear notch, the smooth rounded portion will kind of, kind of fit in or latch on to the trochlea of your humerus to form your elbow hinge joint as well. And then here are your carpal bones. You have eight carpal bones, four in the proximal row and then four in the distal row. And then you have metacarpal bones form the palm of your hand. And then you have proximal, middle, and distal phalanxes or phalanges. You only have a proximal and a distal phalanx of the thumb because your thumb only bends in two spots, whereas the digits of your other four fingers have a proximal, middle, and distal phalanx because your fingers bend in three spots. Uh, the carpal bones of your wrist, there's some mnemonic devices. Sally, Sally left the party to take Kathy home, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, tra trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. So there's different ways to remember the eight carpal bones of the wrist. Um, a couple things to note, you can kind of get oriented by you know, focusing um, maybe even on the thumb side first. So the scaphoid will be on the thumb side. And then we go proximally, Skip. Sally left the party. So those four in the proximal row. And then if we go back to the thumb, we start with this T again, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate to take Kathy home. So there's different mnemonic devices you can use or you can just study them by looking too. So then we'll move on to the lower limb. And I know we're rushing through, but we are spending three hours in lab doing this as well. So if you, we won't have lab on Wednesday with me, but please spend some time reviewing this. So the pelvic girdle then connects your lower limbs to the axial skeleton, and it's made up of your pelvis, which includes the pelvic girdle and your coccyx and sacrum. And then these, it's made up of your ischium, the ilium, and then the acetabulum, and we'll go through that. So here's a look at the pelvis. It includes the sacrum and the coccyx, but then it connects to the ilium bones. Here's the pubis bones, and then the ischium bone is in the back. And this makes what we call a subpubic ankle in the front, which will vary if you are a male or a female. We'll talk about that. And this in general is called your hip bone. Um, the pubic symphysis is a piece of fibrocartilage that keeps the pubis bones joined together. It will soften and separate during late pregnancy. Um, the acetabulum is the kind of socket part of the ball of the head of the femur that will sit in the ball and socket joint of your hip. And then we have different um, structures, the anterior superior iliac spine, ASIS, um, the iliac crest, you can see this here. The area where the ilium connects to your sacrum is called the sacral ilio joint, as I'm kind of shading and highlighting right now. And we'll go over you know, this in a little more detail in lab. Here's your obturator frame and another hole that you have obturator blood vessels and nerves traveling through as well. And then it, we can kind of separate, you'll notice that your hip bones, there are two of them and then they come together and connect to your sacrum in the back and the, the pubis bones connect together at the front. But if we kind of separate them out and just look at one, we can look at their structures a little bit better. 
everything in green. So I'm just gonna draw a line here. Everything in green, kind of that what makes up the top half of the hip hop bone is your ilium bone. And then if we separate down and kind of make a T, the back side bottom half is made up of your ischium bone and the front side bottom half is made up of your pubis bone. So kind of separate it out by drawing a T. And we th see these three bones, the ischium, ilium, and pubis, they all fuse together during development in the acetabulum, which is the ball and socket joint area. Um, and they fuse together to form the hip bone. And then we have different bone markings, which I'm sure you all love by now. We have the ischial spine, which is just a little spinous process that sticks out a big kind of notch called the greater sciatic notch. This area I'm just gonna shade in is called the auricular surface. This is where your sacrum will um, attach to the ilium. We have the pelvic brim, which is a nice ridge. Um, and you can see the ischial tuberosity, which is kind of the bump on the ischial, ischium bone itself. Here we have differences between male and female pelvises. The male subpubic angle, as you might have guessed, is much more narrow, and the subpubic angle of the female is much wider. In general, females, their hips kind of flare. They have a much larger um, kind of, this, this area is called the pelvic inlet. So the red or the orange dashed line is called the pelvic inlet and the pelvic outlet is in blue. And in general, the pelvic inlet and outlet of females is just much wider and kind of flared open, again, for possible childbearing purposes. Um, so you can see those differences shown there. Then the lower limb bones, they kind of take on the similar structure as your upper limb. So you just as you have one kind of humerus, you'll have one femur in the upper limb part. You'll have a patella, which is the kneecap, and then the tibia and fibula are the parallel bones that make up the lower leg. Your tarsals are your ankle bones, metatarsals are the bones of your feet, and then your phalanges are the toes and fingers. So here we have the lower limb bones. The femur is the longest bone in the body. You see your kneecap is the patella, and then the tibia and fibula are shown there. The tibia is the thicker medial bone, and the Fibula is flimsy, it's on the lateral lower leg side. Your tarsal bones are the ankle bones and then you have metatarsal and phalange bones. So a similar um, kind of description or how they're laid out as the upper limb. Then we get to the femur. So we'll zoom in on the femur. We have the head of the femur, the neck of the femur and then the greater and lesser trochanter which are bumps on the femur to allow for attachment sites for other ligaments. The linea aspera is the ridge on the back side of the femur. And then we have big kind of medial and lateral condyles, which will allow your femur to sit on your tibia at your knee. And then we have smaller kind of epicondyles, which are bumps on the medial and lateral side. There's kind of a surface or a groove for your patella to sit in there. And then here we have a triangular shaped patella as well. Then you have your tibia and fibula. The tibia is nice and thick. It's on the medial side. You'll have a tibial tuberosity, which is a bump you could feel right below your patella. There's condyles on the tibia, which will be where your femur condyles will sit on. So you have a nice connection there. And then you have a head of your fibula. And then you have a lateral and a medial malleolus, which is what you guys, we can kind of feel as ankle bones, but they're not technically part of your tarsal bones, but they're called lateral and medial malleoluses. Um, and you can feel them as kind of the pointed kind of ankle bones on your ankle. And then the bones of the foot, we have seven tarsal bones. Uh, the calcaneus is your heel. The talus, you'll see uh, an articular cartilage surface where your talus will connect with the tibia. You can see how your tibia sits on top there. And then you have navicular bone, you have a nice cuboid bone in your ankle, and then you have kind of a one, two, three um, cuneiform bones, lateral, intermediate, medial. Here are your five metatarsal bones labeled with Roman numerals with one being the big toe, just like metacarpal one was the one by your thumb. And then you have digits and phalanges in the same way where your great toe just has a proximal and a distal phalange 
And then your four other toes have a proximal, middle, and distal phalange as well. So that makes up the bones of your foot. We'll talk a little bit about articulations and joints before we end here. So we'll be done maybe in about 10 more minutes. Um, and articulation is just another word for a, a joint where two bones can come together and joints can be classified structurally as fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial, or according to the major connective tissue types that bind the bones together and whether a fluid joint capsule is present. And then they can also be classified according to their degree of motion as synarthroses, amphiarthroses, or diarthroses. And we'll talk about what that means. So first of all, if we structurally classify your joints, and again, this is um, just describing when two bones come together, we can have a fibrous joint, which are united by fibrous connective tissue. An example of sutures, the bones of your skull, a syndesmosis, which are um, the fibers uh, between the, the ulna and radius and the tibia and fibula. And the gomphoses is the joint that your teeth sit in. Cartilaginous are united by cartilage. We can have synchondroses and symphyses. And synovial are filled by joint fluid cavities. And most of the joints of your appendicular skeleton, your knees, your elbows, your fingers are all synovial joints. And then the functional classification of joints by how they move, as synarthrosis is a completely non-movable joint, like your skull bone articulations, and amphiarthrosis is a slightly movable joint, so such as the joints between your vertebrae, and then a diarthrosis is completely movable, like your ball and socket joint of your arm, your shoulder, your knee, your elbow, and your wrist, your hip. Fontanelles and sutures, so I talked a little bit how the bones of the skull will come together and fuse within the first year of life. And a fontanelle is another word for a soft spot. And again, the infant skull has several fontanelles so that the um, brain can continue growing in the first year of life, but also so that an infant skull can fit through the birth canal. So here are where different fontanelles are located. And then again, they'll completely all fuse um, within the first 12 months of life. So you kind of have four major ones that I've circled here. The one that might take a little bit longer is the frontal fontanelle. It might not completely close um, maybe until the baby is 15, 16 months old. Here's the structure of a synovial joint. And these are the joints that make up most of your joints in your appendages, your arms and legs. And synovial refers to the fact that they're filled with fluid. So we have this joint capsule made up of membranes, bursa are extra kind of protective pieces. You see articular cartilage, which are forming the ends of those bones. And then this joint cavity will be filled with synovial fluid to allow for kind of frictionless movement um, between these synovial joints. And then these are the different types of synovial joints found throughout the body. We have plane joints where the movement is in one plane like your vertebrae. Um, saddle joints, the big one here is between um, your thumb, your metacarpal thumb and the first um, phalange. It looks like a saddle, how they fit together. Hinge joints, the big one here is um, the elbow joint between your ulna and your humerus. A pivot joint, you have a pivot joint between your radius and ulna. Then you have ball and socket joints in your hips and shoulders. And then the last one is the um, ellipsa joint, kind of an um, atlanto-occipital joint where the base of your skull fits on your first cervical vertebra, kind of they can move in a kind of a, a rotating or rocking motion. Um, types of movement and understanding these types of movement are important. We, we always talk about them as we're talking with joints because they allow your body to move. Whenever we say flexion or extension, that refers to bending or straightening of a limb. Um, abduction and adduction refer to moving a limb away from the midline. So for example, um, if my arm is down at my side, if I abduct it and bring it away from the midline, that's an abduction movement. And then if I bring my arm back down, I'm adducting it, I'm adding it back to the midline. Uh, pronation and sunation, rotating the forearm with the palms down is called pronation, like you want to pick something up. 
And then supination is rotating your forearm with palms up. That's supination. And then rotation is movement of any structure um, about the longitudinal axis. And this just shows you different examples of flexion, extension, pronation, supination. Um, another good one is if your middle finger is the midline, abduction would be abducting your fingers away from the midline. And then adduction is adding them back, moving toward the midline. So you can see different movements here, medial lateral rotation, either moving a limb part towards the midline or away. And then circumduction is kind of a complete rotation um, movement using all of the above. And then I think our last slide, I promised you at the end of every um, body system talk, we go over how we're all aging and our bodies are dying. Um, but specifically on your skeletal system and joints, we get decreased collagen production. We lose a lot of bone density. So it's important to continue weight bearing exercises, take calcium supplements, especially if you're a female and you have other degenerative changes where your bone tissue actually can degenerate, degenerate and that's called osteoporosis. All right, so that was a marathon of a lecture.